stay curious, stay hungry, go down a road, just pursue it with as much passion as you can. As you're going down it, you might decide, you know what? That's not for me. I'm, I want to do something else. That is Dr. Mariah McCauley. And this is the Vin Foundation's Veterinary Pulse podcast. I'm Jordan Benchia, Executive Director of the VIN Foundation. Join me and our co-host and VIN Foundation board member, Dr. Matt Holland, as we talk with veterinary colleagues about critical topics and share stories. Stories that connect us as humans, as animals, as a veterinary community. This podcast is made possible by individual donors like you who donate to the VIN Foundation. Thank you. Please check the episode notes for bios, links, and information mentioned. All right. Well, welcome, Mariah. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Matt. This is a fun, fun conversation I'm looking forward to. Yeah. And a brief intro for how we met. Um, We had been following each other on social media, uh, kind of lurking on each other's spaces for a couple years. And then <laughs> um, I like out of the blue saw one of uh, one of Mariah's Instagram posts that was like perfectly aligned with the Rising Leaders webinar a few weeks ago. And I thought, okay, I've been like I've been a fanboy for a while. Why, like, why not just take the leap and see if Mariah will answer my DM? And with flying colors, did she answer my DM? And we <laughs> had a phone call. And then on the phone call, we were like, you should come on the podcast. And so now she's on the podcast. So again, thanks for joining us. <laughs> I know. I feel like you kind of uh, are elevating me much higher than I should really should be um, with that kind of intro. But um, equally so, when I saw that you reached out, I was like, what, the Matt Holland is in, was like messaging me, which if you, if anybody is familiar with SAVMA, which is a student American Veterinary Med- Medical Association, uh, Matt has a history through there. I've also been through SAVMA. So he's kind of a little bit of a legend there. So when he had messaged, I was like, oh my gosh, this this is the human who was messaging me. So it's kind of cool that we were both um, following each other for a while. And then we finally connected on social media. But the power of what the new age is and technology, is it's brought us here. So I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah. And now I think you elevated me way too high, but my <laughs> therapist Hey, take the take the compliment and run. So there we go. And, just just go with it. So thank you. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I, let's let's get right to it. So how did you get to where you are? What's your story? Mm, my story. Let's see. How much time do we got here for this? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you want. As long as we got. All right. So yeah, my name right now, my name is Dr. Mariah McCauley. It's still a little bit weird to call myself doctor because I've only been doing this for a little over nine months now uh, that I've officially been a doctor. But I most recently I've been working as a small animal general practitioner in Northern Virginia and loving what I'm doing there. Absolutely loving it. Great mentorship, great practice, just all around amazing. Uh, But before working as a veterinarian, I was in vet school in Scotland. So I did my last four years, my full, full four years of studies in Scotland in Edinburgh. And I graduated from the Royal Dick School of Veterinary Studies back in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. So a lot, a lot has happened here recently, but that is my, that's my veterinary education in a nutshell. Um, But before that, I was an upstate New York person. I I went to undergrad there. I lived most of my life there, Um, barring one teeny tiny little bit of seven months where I worked in Kentucky um, with racing thoroughbreds. But outside of that, that's, that's really me, me in a nutshell there. That is funny, like the teeny tiny little bit of seven months, that's about like almost exactly how long I departed from uh, my roots, which are outside and also inside Chicago. Um, I moved to New York City for seven months and to work for the Major League Baseball Network. Um, and that was all in my pre-vet career, which brings me to uh, a question I have about 
you know, like, what would you tell pre-vets? What, you know, what do you know now that you wish you would have known then when you were either a pre-vet or applying or um, mm. in that, in that phase? Oh, that's a really good question. Let's see here. What would I have told at least my pre-vet self? Um, hmm. Other than buckle up, you're about to go on a really, a really crazy roller coaster ride. Um, but that I know for myself, like that was going into veterinary medicine uh, was something that growing up, I, it wasn't like a defining moment. It was just literally, I, everything I did pointed towards working with humans and working with uh, animals in a medical setting. So I knew my trajectory was going to be veterinary medicine, but if I could go back and like tell myself something or or even just any of the pre-vets, it would be just do what you love. Like literally find the thing, find the niche of what it is that you really love and latch onto that and not focus on like what everyone else tells you the veterinary profession has to be Mm. because there are so many facets that you can go into. There are so many different trajectories you can take that like as a pre-vet, you think, oh, I like animals. And so I'm going to be a vet when in fact, it's like, it is so much more than that. And so just uh, making that awareness um, so that the expectations and the realities can be different for pre-vets. That's kind of, that's where I would go and probably tell myself um, if I could go back in time. Yeah. And I mean, I didn't, I didn't know about this resource when I was a pre-vet and what you just described, like, I like animals, so I'm going to be a vet reminds me of um, one of the Venn Foundation resources. um, I want to be a veterinarian Um, that that helps navigate folks um, through that stage of their veterinary journey. Um, And and so now, like, we're just moving the window, I don't know, four or five years up and how do you, you know, what would you tell yourself um, that you know now that you didn't know then um, about finding that niche, about finding that part of the profession that um, is is the best fit or maybe, you know, a good fit, let's say. And, and the reason I asked that question in particular is because um, you told me during our first conversation that you felt like you hit the jackpot with the clinic you found. And so like how to help others kind of get that feeling too. Mm -hmm. Oh no. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, stay curious. That is like the, the one thing that's going to help you find where you're supposed to be because like right now you could have the idea of, I like, even for myself, when I started vet school, I wanted to be an equine vet. Like that is what I was going to do. I was going to graduate. I was going to go back to Kentucky. I was going to work with racing thoroughbreds. And here I am working as a small animal general (laughs) practitioner in Northern Virginia. And I'm not even done on my journey, guys. Like there are other things that I'm probably going to end up doing, but it's just, no, really seriously. (laughs) Oh, I love that. It's like, no, really. Um, So yeah, there's a lot, there's so much more that's going to happen for me. And so for myself, if I like talking to, to first year veterinary students, what I would literally say is stay curious, stay hungry and go down a road. Like honestly, just pursue it with as much passion as you can. And then as you're going down it, you might decide, you know what, that's not for me. I'm I want to do something else. Or maybe you stick with it for five or 10 years. And then you say, you know what? I want to add a little extra flavor to, to what I'm doing. And you, and you just change. And knowing that you always have the opportunity to pivot, like it opens up so much freedom and allows yourself so much more grace when you're going through things. Because I think there, especially for vet students, they think I have to know what I'm going to do when I graduate. Like I have to know what it is. And if I change my mind, then that's, that's, uh, that looks bad on me and what everyone's expecting of me. And that in itself has like a whole different range of, <laughs> of, uh, psychological things that we could talk about. But, um, <laughs> just like literally to stay curious. Cause if the more you look into something, the more you learn about it, you will either continue to love it and want to keep diving deeper and becoming more skilled in that area, or you'll find what your true passion is, or at least one of one of your future true passions um, of what it is. If you just stay curious about it. I love that. I, um, I think it closely describes what happened to me and I hadn't even really thought about it that way. So I thought mm-hmm. I was going to be like, you thought you were going to be an equine vet. 
Um, I thought I was going to be the next James Harriet and have a clinic out of my truck and like drive through the countryside. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, in school, I took those courses and the professor who taught those courses also taught public health and policy. And through, you know, you would say staying curious. I, I think he would call it staying annoying. Like I always, <laughs> I always stayed after class and asked extra questions and bothered him and like emailed him on the weekends and stuff because I just, I really, I, I don't know. I just felt like a bond with him. I really liked him and I kept picking his brain. And um, the long story short is that I didn't end up going into that kind of practice or any practice after school. I went into policy and government work. Um, and I think it was through staying curious. So yeah, I love that. Um, you also mentioned in that answer, um, like, you know, maybe, maybe part of finding your niche is adding a bit of extra flavor, which is like a perfect segue into what I want to ask about <laughs> during your veterinary student part of the journey um, is a little bit of extra flavor on the side in, in the form of your own podcast. Oh yeah. That little tiny thing I do on the side, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just good. Just mentioned that there. Right. Um, so yeah. So the podcast, uh, it's called that vet life and I've been running it for a little over three ish, almost four years now. I think I've lost track honestly, but yeah, that was the little, one of the little extra bits of flavor I added when I was a, uh, a veterinary student. Um, some people might call it a stupid decision to do in the middle of everything else that was happening because I was one of those people that just had to have my fingers in a bunch of different pots or whatever <laughs> metaphor you want to use, spinning a bunch of plates. It's just how I operated the best. And if the one extra thing I wanted to add was a little bit of podcasting on the side. And that was partly because I had always had an interest in media and marketing. And I had dabbled in making a couple really crappy videos <laughs> when I was younger and just trying different things. And so when the opportunity arose to essentially there was a grant that was available and I applied, I got it. And I was like, Hey, okay, so what am I going to do with this thing? I guess I'm going to make a podcast with it. Oh, cool. And <laughs> that was, that's kind of how it all happened. Um, but the, the fuel behind that was I had been learning from so many different veterinarians from all over, like all over the world, literally. And I wanted to be able to share those stories and share those those lessons learned with my colleagues and with my peers. And so doing a podcast, I figured was a great way to share those stories. It also would allow me to work on my communication skills and just storytelling skills in general, which is where the podcast has morphed into. Um, so initially, it literally was just me talking to veterinarians about the cool things that they'd done in their life. And then eventually, actually, what was it? Oh, my goodness. Just about a year ago is when it made the transition. I took a little time off um, to finish school. And then the pandemic happened. And I was like, oh, what's a better time to just completely revamp the podcast than <laughs> a pandemic? You know, I have all this time on my hands, apparently. So I'll just revamp it. So that's what I did. And I decided to basically just do a little baby pivot off of what I had been doing and focus on not the stories themselves per se, per se but the actual art of the storytelling. Mm. And as someone who was going into general practice, um, I knew there was a ton of opportunity for communication skills, but I didn't want to call it communication skills because that was boring. So <laughs> I wanted to call it storytelling skills. And I started doing just general episodes about storytelling. And then I also dove a little bit deeper and I started doing shorter episodes called skill set where I would talk with veterinarians about a specific skill. So like, I think one of the first ones I did was with Tanasia Crocker. And we talked about the first time you meet a client in the consult room. Ha, huh, little did I know we would still be in a pandemic doing curbside and I haven't <laughs> actually met with a client in a room and ever. So, um, but that pod, that episode is still there for the day that we do go back to in-person uh, consults. But other episodes I've done have to do with like euthanasia or um, dental uh, work or just different little bits where, oh yeah, being a female young doctor and how do you respond to clients that way? Um, I did that episode with Dr. Kirsten Rongren 
um, at Vet Redefined. And so I have a ton of different episodes that are about that, but that's, that's where the podcast has morphed. But to go back to your original question, like, why did I want to do this? At that time, I didn't know that I wanted to do it because I love storytelling. I knew that I, I liked sharing stories and hearing from other people. So that's one of those cases where I just stayed curious about it. I started to learn a lot more about the podcast. Uh, that's what I was going to say. World. So yeah, go for it. Go for it. Oh no, that you stayed curious. You stole yeah. my line. <laughs> stole it, used it. Oh, we both <laughs> used it. There we go. Um, but yeah, so that's, I mean, it all just came out of this initial curiosity of wanting to do something more and not just do veterinary medicine as the medicine side of things. I wanted to um, continue to grow and learn. And so that's, that's, that's honestly the truth of where the podcast came out of. And like, Talking about how you were spinning so many different plates, I mean, you you're also involved with Sadma, mm -hmm. and um, like, do you do you think it was ever like too much, or did it did it was it the other way where like like staying busy helped uh, help the vet school experience, or or how did I that go? I think for myself, it did help the vet school experience just because it forced me to stay doing things, stay out there and uh, meeting new people and networking and working on different skills. Because otherwise, if I wasn't doing all these things, I can 100% bet that I would have just been staying in my room, studying all the time, probably hating what I was doing and burning out a little bit. Mm. So for me, I needed to stay busy. I needed to be a part of SAVMA. I needed to be a part of the BVA, which is the British Veterinary Association. I needed, needed to be on the rugby team. I needed to be training for half marathons. I needed to be doing a podcast. Um, I needed to uh, be involved in um, my church that was, that was there. And so I needed to be doing all of these different things. And it wasn't a, like, I'm so anxious and I need to be doing something or else like, I don't know what to do with myself. It was just that I had so much passion and interest in all these different areas. And I was like, I don't want to miss out on this. This is like four years of awesomeness. Um, I don't want to let it to go, go, let it go to waste. Um, cause I know this is also time to practice how I handle balancing all of these different things and working on a symbiosis between my work in my life, um, or the, my work in the rest of my life, um, before I go out into practice. Yeah. How like, like being a veterinary student is not only, is not being a student of only veterinary related topics. You're also a student of self and mm -hmm. it sounds like you really have a good relationship with yourself and you know yourself and you know what, like what kind of balance you need to strike to feel, um, you know, to feel like you are uh, doing the right things, I guess. Mm -hmm. No, I like that. I like the way you said that as a student of self, but yeah, I definitely needed to, to like learn what my boundaries were and learn <clears throat> what it looked like for me to approach those boundaries or push past my comfort zone. Um, because if I didn't do it then in vet school where I had the safety bubble of life, um, then just trying to do all of that now probably would have been a bit more difficult, not impossible, but definitely more difficult. And that's not to say I did it perfectly. I, I definitely stretched myself thin more than I should have probably in those first couple of years. But again, that was part of the learning opportunity. I had to stretch myself that far in order to know, you know what, maybe you really need to hand off that extra task or you need to delegate a bit better. But again, that, that's just part of the learning process. Yeah, it's like you don't know what being stretched too thin feels like until you feel it at least once. Exactly. And you sort of have to know for navigating the rest of life. Mm -hmm. um, and well, so I guess to, br to bring it back to the podcast, I wonder how you feel about that in relationship to your life after school? Is it more or less the same? Like it kind of fits into your life or is it, um, is it something you're thinking about? Like, you know, maybe one day you said, you know, you will do other things one day. Like, do you ever have a vision about how like, that's like your main job or? <laughs> my, my dreams are very big right now. Um, <laughs> I have very varied um, <laughs> dreams and goals and um, expectations for myself. And so I try to, I'm trying to keep them within reason for, okay, here's my plan for my first year, which is literally 
just become a very, like a really good general practitioner, learn how to better communicate with my clients and take care of them as a whole um, and their patient and my patients and take care of my team members. And once I'm able to kind of figure out those pieces, then I can say, okay, what are the next five years of my life look like? What are the things that I want to achieve? And part of it includes the podcast and growing that and seeing where it goes. Um, and the other part is the, the, practicing medicine side, which I definitely see myself practicing medicine, um, most likely at the same practice that I'm at, at least for the next five years, um, if not more. But then I also want to be adding in a little bit of flavor of other things <laughs> um, here and there, um, whether that means going and doing more mission type work or maybe dabbling a bit more in mixed animal practice because I have a deep passion for sheep and horses. Um, so trying to figure out a way to combine those in my future life um, is, is all part of the grand plan, but the podcast definitely fits in there. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was going to ask, but you just answered, like, if you're thinking about horses, since that was uh, once th like the love, um, mm -hmm. but it sounds like, yeah, maybe you are. And yeah. And maybe and it's not maybe it's not working with them on a medicine side of things, but maybe I, I'm working with them um, with like a youth program or again, with any kind of mission work. Like there's just so many different opportunities where I could still be doing that, but not maybe not the medicine side for that specific species. Yeah. Yeah. No, there are, um, well, that like leads into one other question I had is like, there are so many things you could do uh, there are too many things to do with, with just one <laughs> there, lifetime. Yeah, there's literally too many. <laughs> um, and you've you've probably heard of a lot of them with how many episodes would you estimate you've recorded? Oh, Nelly. Uh, at this <laughs> point, I am easily over the hundred mark, um, if not a little bit more. I, I don't keep track as well as I should. But I think last time uh, we talked, you kind of estimated a number for me and it was a little over a hundred, I think. So, okay. If you could, I mean, this is impossible, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> um, if you could distill all of those down into, you know, like a, a message to, to the listeners out there, like what have you learned from talking to so many different people in this profession around the world? Hmm. Oh gosh. Really put me on the spot with that one. Um, <laughs> um, 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 ha. I would say that what I've learned from these years of doing podcasting and talking to, to people about their stories is that you as an individual, you have a story to tell. It is immensely valuable, not just only to yourself, but to the people around you. And the, the most important thing that you can do is to stay true to that and to continue to tell your story. Because regardless of how boring or how terrible you think it is, it has value and it has purpose in, in your own life and in the lives of others. So keep telling your story. I could not agree more. It reminds me of an axiom that uh, is used in the policy world a lot, which is, I mean, I think it's used outside the policy world, but that's where I heard it and used it a whole bunch is um, think global, act local. And Ooh, I like that. And yeah, just like telling your story to the people around you, like whether that's the people you live with, people at work, people you hang out with on social media, like keep keep telling your story because it is immensely valuable. And, and yeah, exactly what you said, like no matter how boring or terrible you think it is, it like it matters. And it also matters to tell it like the act of telling your story matters. So yes, mm -hmm. um, totally agree. And then also just keep, keep telling other, like inspiring other people to tell their story, which I guess that's, the the three tenets that I have for my podcast is that I hope that it inspires, encourages, and challenges other people. And that's what I hope to do in my own daily life um, is to inspire, encourage, and the more difficult part of things to challenge people in an edifying manner, um, which is, it's not easy to do, but it, it takes, it takes practice and challenging myself. Okay. So, I mean, I might put you on the spot with this one again. Oh but, dear. Here we go. But you just said like, that's the challenging one is, 
or that's the, (laughs) well, yeah, you did. You said challenging is challenging. So, Mm -hmm. which makes sense. How, in, in an edifying manner, how, like, what are some tips? How do you challenge people in a way that like feels productive Mm -hmm. and effective? That again, it's something that I'm continuing, continuing to learn, but when it comes to like, when you want to challenge someone to do better in their own life or to become a better version of themselves, you're not doing it in a way that says, oh, you're a terrible person. I don't think like you're just, you're just a bad person. You shouldn't do that kind of thing. Whereas instead you could be saying, you know, I think there's so much more potential in you. Like, why are you doing this? Or like, that's, that's like the most extreme version I can think of. But even if it's something like say a, a a veterinary student, a first year veterinary student where they just aren't doing well on their grades, they feel like they're not able to balance everything or (laughs) you can't balance things. You can symbiose things, but um, (laughs) use that word, but to encourage them and challenge them to work on their, on their skills, to work on the things outside of just the grades because you believe in them because you know they have potential. And so you're challenging them to do better in their grades, to do better um, in their, in their, in their balance of things. Um, But you're doing it in a way that says you can keep doing this. You have potential. It's not challenging them and saying, Oh, you're just a bad student. Um, So it, I guess I'm not doing a very good job of explaining this, but the edifying manner is something that it, it's not easy for us to do. We want to put, it's very easy for us to challenge someone in a way that's putting them down rather than lifting them up. So I guess that's, that's the simplistic way of saying it <laughs> and definitely came out a lot more fluent than the first time I tried to explain that. Yeah, I mean, you said you didn't think you were doing a good job of explaining it, but it reminded me, like, what, how you were saying it before, like, totally reminded me of an experience I had um, earlier today. I was editing a document for someone, and um, I, you know, like, put on track changes and leave a comment, and my the first comment I made on the sentence was, like, this is poorly worded. And I was looking at that and I was like, I mean, I do feel that way. It is true. But is that, is that like going to help as much as it could if Mm -hmm. I said it a different way? And so I sat and thought, and I, I decided to, um, I decided to like reference a different part of the document and say, this part was really good. Like, I know that you like, I know that you're capable of writing this way. And I think this sentence could be more like that one. And I mean, I don't know if it made a difference in, in that person's experience, but like, I thought, I kind of thought what you just described is like trying to be uplifting instead of putting someone down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And it's not something that we're, we're very attuned to doing in the, in the human race essentially. But when you choose the, the more edifying option of challenging someone, the, the end result is that they then go on to think more, more positively about themselves. They act more positively and they influence people more positively. So it's, it has an, a knock-on effect. And that's honestly, even today, I was actually reading a book by Dale Carnegie. It's um, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. um, it was kind of, it actually talked about that a little bit. And I was like, hot dang, right there. <laughs> it says it right <laughs> there in the book. Um, but um, I was kind of excited to see something that I've been thinking about just pop up in the book. But um, but yeah, so that that's, it's not an easy thing to do. And I know I've not done it well in the past, um, which is why I'm working on improving it. But that's, again, part of the reason that it's, it's, a, it's a daily practice. And it's something that I feel everybody should be instigating for themselves, not, not only because it, Im, it impacts themselves, but it then impacts the people that are around them. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I really agree with that. And I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Like, I wasn't expecting to talk about challenging people in an edifying way. I, I like the way you put that. Um, you also you also said there's, I think this is how you phrased it. There's no balance. There's only 
you can't balance things. You can only symbiose things. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So what, I, yeah, there's gotta be some more behind that. Yeah. So I'm trying to remember if that's entirely my own thing or if I somewhat stole the snatched that from someone else. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one of my own mentors, Dr. Gary Marshall, um, he's on Instagram at it might get weird. Um, he's an absolutely fantastic, phenomenal, inspiring, encouraging, challenging person, um, in the veterinary profession, who's just continually, continually looking to uplift the up and coming veterinarians of the profession. So if you haven't checked out, checked him out on Instagram, go and do that. But yeah, I can confirm <laughs> solid, solid, solid dude. human being. Yeah. But um, I, I think it was around the same time we both kind of came up. I don't we must have been watching or listening to the same influences. But we came uh, to the point where one of us said, like, you can't balance something. There is no work life balance. There is work life symbiosis. And it's essentially this idea. It's not like a proven theory or any any kind of wishy washy stuff. Or, but it, I demand something. Proof. You demand proof. Okay. So I'll, I'll work on that for you, Matt. Um, <laughs> I'll work on some research for you there, but the, the core of it is that when you try to perfectly balance your work and your life, you will fail and you will fail spectacularly. So, and that will just lead to um, a little bit more of a burnout kind of situation because you'll be struggling to try and balance things when you, when you actually can't, but what you can do is you could find a symbiosis between the two, which if we look at the basics of biology, you have a symbiosis kind of uh, system where the, the two areas, or at least in a basic, basic model, there's like two air, two um, systems and each of them um, work to positively impact the other. And so in that way, your work and your life can positively impact e each other um, in that your work works to support your life and your life is there to support your work and vice versa. And you'll also then realize that because there is no perfect balance, like even if you try to put the two things on a balancing scale, some days your work will tip more towards that. And other days, the scale will tip more towards your life. And so you'll constantly be going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of this back and forth tipping action that kind of provides the energy to keep going from one to the other. So that's the symbiosis. And so that's the the idea, which, I mean, I have to give some of the credit to, to Gary on that one um, for coming up with it. Or I, I honestly don't even remember who came up with it at this point, but um, uh, credit does not matter at this point. But yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the whole thing behind symbiosis. Where were we going with that? I forgot. Uh, I don't know, but it <laughs> it, remind, <laughs> it reminded me of how um, like creating creating expectations also increases the chance of failure. Like if you, oh yeah, if you think of you know like well my my days are going to look like this because I have achieved work-life balance then you're playing a risky game there because like the minute they don't look like what your vision was then you have failed like you said and failed spectacularly and you'll feel like you messed up when like when maybe all that needed to change was the vision, which is like exactly what you just described. Like, well, some days it'll look like this and some days it'll look like that. And not only is that okay, but like it can feed off of itself. Like if you put a bunch of, if you put a bunch of energy into work and you have a supportive work culture, which is like an entirely separate discussion, but hopefully you do, um, then like you can take time in the next wave and put a whole bunch of energy into life and like then the vision was it was always going to be changing anyway and then you can't really fail that vision mm -hmm. yeah um but maybe you know maybe that's just my unbridled optimism speaking no 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 keep going with that i think you're, you're definitely <laughs> on something there um well, we'll have to find a way to, to prove it. We need some evidence-based <laughs> discussion. On yeah, this one. some EBVM there, so. <laughs> um, all right. I am wondering if you have a favorite quote or two or maybe a handful. 
Okay. Um, I think that it's not really like the greatest quote on the face of the earth, but it kind of uh, works well for being a new grad vet and it, or even just any kind of vet at this point, but it, it's basically do what you can with what you got and the rest of it will go from there. But even just like thinking about what I did with the podcast or even just going through vet school, there's so much that you could sit there and say, I can't do it because I don't have, or this won't happen, or I just, I won't be able to do this because I don't have X, Y, Z, then you're going to put yourself in a lot of sticky situations. But um, if you've ever had the opportunity to work with a mixed animal vet or any kind of farm vet, you'll <laughs> learn that they, they kind of go hard with this quote and they, they literally do exactly what they can with anything that they have. And it's such a good way to, to learn from and kind of carry on with whatever you do in life, because you could sit there and say, oh, I don't have this fancy bit of equipment that we had in vet school in the ivory tower of vet school, but I have this, um, you can certainly make things happen. Um, and whether that's in veterinary medicine or just in your own dreams or your own goals, if you start with what you have and what you have doesn't have to be like a physical thing or monetary value, um, that could even be the network that you have. If you start with the network of people that are around you, the, um, the skills that you have in your hands and whatever happens to be sitting around you physically, you can make something happen. And then from there, it'll continue to grow and continue to grow. And eventually it may take a very long time, mind you, but you eventually you will be able to achieve whatever goal that you have. Um, and keeping that, that little bit of information where it might take a lot longer than you expect, um, but keeping that in the back of your mind will certainly help with whatever goal you are trying to achieve. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, so when the, when the pandemic started, well, so my wife and I moved from Washington, DC to my parents' house, um, a month before the pandemic started. And our plan was to, um, and my parents' house is outside Chicago. Our the plan was to move, to, like use this place as a home base to look for a place to live in the city. And the pandemic hit and we were still living at my parents' house. Um, and the do what you can with what you got was like, my bike was in storage and I love biking. It's like um, almost as therapeutic as writing haiku is for me. And I was like, I don't have my bike. And like, what am I, what am I supposed to do? Like, I can't go buy a bike. It's the, it's a global pandemic. I can't like mm -hmm. go inside and I have my legs. And I also had my wife who likes walking. And now we've got this great daily walking habit that we never had in DC. Um, That's awesome. And I think we're going to keep it indefinitely. And it's kind of, yeah, like, yeah, do, you know, do what you can with what you got. And I like that. No, that's um, such a good example of using it because um, like in my mind, I was trying to come up with some medical example of, of using it. And I was like, oh, I'm blanking here. But you came up with a, with a perfect one there where it literally you, you saw an opportunity that was around you and you you took it up. And it, I mean, look at the, the, the flip side. You've come out with a wonderful habit as a result. And so that's something that can be used in anybody's life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. I mean, you said you started that with like underselling it, saying it's, you know, maybe not the greatest quote on the face of the earth, but <laughs> well, I think it doesn't it's... have, it doesn't have big fancy words in it. So that you, people <laughs> usually, it's not very long. It doesn't have fancy words. People don't usually think that constitutes a good quote, but uh, I like mine. Yeah. We should come up with like a grading matrix for what makes a good quote. <laughs> um, and if you could leave the audience with anything, again, it doesn't have to be just one thing, but what would it be? Hmm. Choices here. Cause now I'm, now I'm asking you to make up your own quote. Oh no. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say just be mindful of where you are in life right now. Um, there are a lot of opportunities that lie ahead that you may think that every single door is getting closed, getting slammed in your face, but the reality is that you're just waiting for the one door that will open. 
And if you're mindful of what's happening in your life right now and not living in the future, there's, there's so much opportunity that will, that'll, that'll come to you. Um, and that you'll be able to make come to fruition. So short and sweet, but that that's what I would leave everybody with. All right. Well, thank you again so much for joining us and uh, hopefully there's a next time. Oh, I, I think there will be a next time, but thank you so much for you guys uh, for having me. It's been a fun conversation and thanks for uh, putting up with my random bunny trails um, of thought that go along <laughs> with having me on as a guest. <laughs> Happy to. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Veterinary Pulse. Please check the episode notes for additional information referenced in the podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow, subscribe, and share review. We welcome feedback and hope you will tune in again. You can find out more about the VIN Foundation through our website, vinfoundation.org, and our social media channels. Thank you for being here. Be well.